Good morning, Fleetwood Bible Church. Good morning, Fleetwood Bible Church. That's a little bit more of a celebration. So it's July 4th today. We're going to celebrate independence. We're going to celebrate freedom. Amen? Now, that means different and just a little bit different in every single person here. So can we just say we're going to celebrate independence and freedom? We're glad that you're here this morning, whether you're here in person, whether you're watching with us, and we're going to begin by turning in our hymnals to 668. Hymn number 668, we're going to stand together and sing. Let's sing together. The church is one foundation. Let's remain standing. Let's turn to hymn number 757. It's a song you'll know, at least the first verse, and we'll sing it together. Hymn number 757. Let's sing together as under the Lord this morning. My country.
God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We just want to welcome you. It's a special day. We ended that song with Great God, Our King. What, what, what a different country we have. We're not ruled by kings. We're not ruled. We have a representative government. So today, let's, let's celebrate. I know there's sometimes we can, we can get down because it's not going the way we think it should. It's not going the way God's word said it should. But we still have a great country. We have lots of freedoms. I'm, a little bit in the announcements, I'm going to tell you, uh, read a letter that we got and uh, just show you a little different side. But we want to welcome you all this morning. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, if you're new, if this is your first day, uh, we want to get to know you. You can check in on our church website or on our app. We, we want to get to know you, get to uh, become familiar with you, and just welcome you to be part of us here at Fleetwood Bible Church today. I don't see Ralph and Betty Reber, but this Saturday they will be married 50 years. That's great. Now we've got the G3 coming up. This is the G8. This isn't about nations. This is the G3. It's the Great Game Gathering. It's coming up starting. Uh, start your stretches and get prepared. It's going to be July 16th. It's an FBC family event held at the Fleetwood High School Stadium. Okay, I'm going to step a little bit out of the way a little, maybe turn this way. So I'm going to get your attention and repeat that. This is for all families. We're going to get together at the Fleetwood High School and, well, maybe if you're kind of like me, you might make a little bit of a fool out of yourself, but it doesn't matter. We're going to have lots of fun. Um, we're going to have Olympics, different kind of family Olympics. And listen, if you don't want to participate, come there. We'll nag you till you do. But just come and watch. It's going to be a lot of fun. The Fleetwood Carnival will be back this year. Last year it was canceled. We missed this last year, but it's back, and we want to have the chance to connect with people in our community and invite children to come to Vacation Bible School with us. We need some volunteers for those evenings. We haven't been, uh, it hasn't been, um, we haven't done it last year, and we've been part of this community for 150 years now, so uh, there's some significance to us being at the carnival and uh, inviting some of our neighbors and friends. See Heidi uh, about that. We, listen, you don't have to be a gifted speaker. You just have to be able to invite people, maybe hand out some flyers, things like that. Vacation Bible School is coming up, and it's this time of year. You can register uh, your children, your neighbors' kids, your grandkids, whomever, uh, on the app or the website today. Go to vbs at fbc.org. Vacation Bible School, vbs at fbc.org. Now, just because we don't have Connection Cafe today does not mean that, that that abundance of vegetables and bread did not come. It came. So if you'd like those things, the vegetables, the bread, they're in the back after the service today. We're not having the Connection Cafe today. So if you left this country and you got on a plane and went for three hours, you, would get to, you could get to Honduras. I just want to read a letter that we here at Fleetwood Bible Church got today. It's from Edwin and Karen Viela. God called us to preach the gospel in the Linca indigenous area in the western part of Honduras. We live in a municipality of Intabuca, the poorest area in the country. Listen, people earn $4 a day growing crops of potatoes, broccoli, cabbage, carrots, corn, string beans, but pests and the high cost of seed negatively affect their income. How much can you affect $4 a day? We live and minister in the community called Togapala. How many of you have been to Togapala? A lot. And we're gonna, and I'm going to ask this question in five years from now. There's going to be a lot more hands, Lord willing. It is a strategic location since leaders, pastors, members of other communities can reach the learning center. God put it on our hearts to start the Rise and Shine Bible Institute to prepare leaders. Last year, we had 23 students from seven different communities and backgrounds who graduated from the program. Additionally, a year ago, we began to teach the word to children and preach the gospel in two other communities where there are no evangelical congregations. Since last October, we partnered with nine other churches to fast and pray that God would change the lives of people in their communities who are bound by alcoholism, witchcraft, and adultery. We know that Jesus Christ came to set people free. 
I missed the paragraph, and I want to back up. I, I want to read this in light of what we celebrate today. It has been very difficult to evangelize. The families that have accepted Christ are seeing opposition from the Catholic Church and are threatened to be expelled from the community and denied access to drinking water. However, little by little, things have been changing. What a striking difference of what we celebrate today and what we hear about uh, what we just got this week. So as we go to prayer this morning, could we stand together? Let's pray about this. We're going to pray about our pastors. We're going to pray about each of us this morning. And let's just pray together and look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to first come and, 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 and bless your name. We sang a song about pronouns being her, and that is your church, who we are a part of. Father, we are grateful for the freedom that we have, the freedom to gather, the freedom to be able to talk about Jesus to those who are lost in a dying world. Lord, we are aware, we are eerily aware of the call today, like we have heard and like we have read from the prophet Samuel, the priest Samuel and the prophet Eli, where the people clamored and said, we want a king, we want a king, give us a king. And it's really not the king they wanted, but they wanted the ability not to follow their creator. So Lord, as we move and go forward in these days, may we pray against that in our lives. May we pray against that in the lives of the four young children who will be baptized today, that they would grow up in a place where they too can share their faith throughout the remainder of their lives as long as you would tarry. Father, we are so blessed. We just ask you to remind us this day of the freedoms that we have. Lord, we have many difficult situations in our lives, and you promised not to remove them, but you promised to walk with us through them. You promised us your best in every situation. And Lord, many times, forgive us, because we mess up. But then you promise your best in the situation that we're in. You're a great God and, and greatly to be praised. Lord, we, we're grateful this morning that we have a pastor and his family on vacation. Lord, would you just be near and dear to them this day? We have a pastor who's healing from an injury. Would you be near and dear to his family today? And we have a pastor who, with his family, is here today, and he'll be here at this spot in just a few moments. Would you, would you just guide and direct his steps? guide and direct his thoughts and, and give him exactly what you would want each of us to hear this day. Father, we bless your name. I am grateful that we can begin to be together again. You have called us to be in relationship with one another. You've called us to be, to, to be your children and to love one another. Thank you, Lord, for this time. We pray your blessing upon it. We ask these things in the, the priceless name of Jesus, who, who has the power and the ability to do anything and everything. There is nothing impossible for him. He can rule and overrule temporary leaders in a community called Togopala. He can rule and overrule leaders who wear suits and ties and work in Washington, D.C. And he can overrule even our stubborn hearts. So, Lord, we ask that you do all those things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Oh, actually, stay standing. We're going to keep singing. <laughs> it's all good, Jeff. Yeah, let's, let's stay standing as we, as we continue to worship our King, to whom we can lift our eyes and we can receive all matter of help, strength, and freedom. Let's sing this morning, church. together. Nothing shall I fear 
on this battleground Nothing shall I fear when the enemy surrounds me You will defend me I won't be afraid, this is not the end I won't be afraid when the odds are stacked against me from the Lord, the maker of it all. My strength comes from the Lord. Everywhere I go, everywhere I go, you are by my side. In every single turn, you're before and you're behind me. Our strength comes from him. There is no one, no one beside our God. So as we continue this morning in our song before the Lord, we're going to get to a point in this song where, where we sing what, what the creatures around the throne are singing, and that is, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Let's join with them this morning as we give praise to our King.
yours forever. Lord, I pray that you would calm our hearts and minds now, that you would open our ears, open our eyes, help us to hear what you have to say this morning through your servant, Pastor Marcos. Please help us to take in everything you want us to take in today, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Buenos dias, Fleetwood Bible. <laughs> it's a tradition now. Come on, we gotta do it every time, every time. Um, well, happy Fourth of July. It's exciting. Oh, it's always exciting uh, to be able to celebrate uh, in the name of the Lord and, and celebrate uh, uh, the country that we were born in, the country that we live in. It's it's a, a beautiful thing, and, and it's also a beautiful thing to see just how great. Uh, God is. Last week we had uh, Dave Crossett uh, speaking to us, and, and it was uh, uh, in, just incredible how God was able to use him to speak uh, to us. Um, and, and I want to apologize if last week was your first time uh, coming here and you loved how he brought the word of the Lord because he was, I mean, he's awesome. He was very organized, very detailed. He, his, his tone was very controlled, and I'm none of that. <laughs> so if you liked his style, I apologize in advance. This is going, we're going to shift gears a bit here in regards to style. The word is the same, though. The word of God remains the same. I'm just warning you because it could be a little bit of a shock. Uh, okay, so you have been warned. Another warning that I usually have is um, I get I'm really loud when I'm passionate about something, and I'm passionate about the Bible. So I'm not yelling at you. I'm just excited, okay? It's okay. And um, the third thing that I want to just say is I'm a very direct person. So as I preach, I might uh, address certain things that I felt the Lord leading me to address in a very direct manner. Um, it's just how I talk. <laughs> so uh, uh, all that I ask is that as we are looking at what God has for us, let's just listen, not only with our ears, but listen, listen with our hearts. And let's allow the word of God to really uh, um, transform us and, and just allow the Lord to speak. Amen? Amen. So... Because it's 4th of July, I thought that uh, there's nothing better than, uh, and I believe one of the most American things to do is just watch movies for the holidays. And a great movie that uh, is an incredible classic uh, that every time that 4th of July comes around, I, I think about is National Treasure. Now, National Treasure is, uh, it's, it holds very dear to my heart. It came out around 2004. Uh, I was just starting middle school maybe, something like that. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm 29, so I don't know how that works out. 2004, I don't even know where I was. Uh, but um, I love this movie. It was treasure hunting. It was you know going from being disgraced to having a bunch of uh, money and recognition. It's the American dream rolled into one, y'all, okay? It was just very exciting stuff. And one of the scenes that, that to me it was always awesome was when, uh, they, they, well, first of all, they stole the Declaration of Independence. Don't do that, okay? That's not good. But uh, the reason why they did this was because they believed that there is a map in the back of the Declaration of Independence. Now, like any good treasure hunter, it's not just blatantly there. You have to do some things. You have to do some digging. And one of the things that they had to do was um, it was written in some kind of invisible ink. And one of the things they had to do was they needed to get some glasses. Ben Franklin's glasses, and they all had different lenses, and depending on what lens you put in, it would actually change what you saw in the back of the Declaration of Independence. So you would go, you know, you put one combination, and that would see one thing, and you put another combination, you would see another thing, and, and it wasn't until you put all the lenses together that you would be able to see the actual message uh, of where the next clue was, because it's treasure hunting, and you never find a treasure, you just find the next clue. Um, but in the same way that those lenses, the way you kind of shuffled them, actually dictated what this person saw um, in some letters and some of the maps, I want to tell you guys that that's the same for us. 
the way we react to things that are happening in our community, the way that we react to the things that are happening in our society, the way that we react to the things that are happening in our country really is dictated by through what lens we're looking through it. And the way that we approach what we believe God wants us to do changes depending on the lens that we view what's happening. So today, the big picture, the main point, is to make sure that we are looking at this country through the lens of the kingdom of God. And we're gonna be reading Daniel chapter three, we're gonna be reading the first 18 uh, verses, and, and, and I really wanna challenge all of us today that as we are reading, we allow the Holy Spirit to truly speak to us, to make sure that whenever we look at this country and what's happening around us, and see if our actions reflect us looking through the lens of the kingdom of God, or if our actions sometimes reflect that we might be looking through another lens. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we come to you at this time thanking you, because we know that you will speak to us. We thank you because today is a day of celebration. We will be celebrating uh, the day of, of this country's independence. We also celebrate baptism later on today, Father, and, and I thank you for that because it's really a lot to rejoice. But right now, Father, all I ask is that you speak to us, that your Holy Spirit can just confront our hearts and our minds and that we would be able to honestly engage with the text and honestly engage with our hearts so that we would be able to respond in the way that we ought to, in humility, submission to you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so let's get right into it. We're going to go Daniel chapter 3. We're going to start reading just uh, the first verse, and we'll go from there. The scripture says, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose, weight, whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Now something, just because I like everybody to kind of transport yourself there, I want you to see these things. I don't want you to just listen and, and, and learn, which is definitely important, but I want you to actually be there, like as if it were a movie. And so the first thing I want you to picture in your mind is this what the Bible describes as an image. Now, there's a little bit of a debate as to whether it was some kind of obelisk like you see on the left uh, because of the dimensions. It's very narrow and very tall. But there's uh, other people that would say, no, it, it's some kind of statue or maybe some com combination of both. It's really unclear, and I'm not smart enough to engage with those conversations. All I know is that the scriptures, the, the original word that is used, salem, is actually used more often in other parts of scripture as image, and sometimes it can be translated as statue. So to me, it seems like it's some kind of statue of some sort. But regardless, uh, um, I don't want to spend too much time on this debate because, again, I'm not smart enough to know which one is the real one. Uh, but I do believe that the author here is trying to point us to a theological uh, uh, kind of ramification or, 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 or a result that's happening here. You see, last chapter in Daniel chapter 2, what you end up seeing is that the, uh, the king has a dream and he challenges his uh, people to tell him what the dream was. He doesn't tell them what it was. He says, you need to tell me what my dream was, and you, to, and you need to tell me its interpretation. And the only person that was able to do that was this guy by the name of Daniel. And what we end up seeing is that uh, the king had a dream where there was a statue, and there was a head of gold, the chest of silver, uh, the middle and thighs of bronze, the legs of iron, and feet of iron and clay. And Daniel tells the king that he represents the head of gold. Now, what's important to notice is that that statue gets demolished. It gets destroyed by a rock. And it is said that, and the interpretation was, that at the end of the day, God, the God of Israel, would one day do away with all that. There's some implication that he would then rule over the earth. Now, 
Imagine you are the king and you just heard that you represent a, the golden head of a statue that just got rocked, literally, by this other king, a god, that is not from your land. You have two choices. You either go, oh, I guess I have to play nice with this king, or you dig in, you double down, you say no. I'm the true king. And, and what I think is starting to happen here is that what we see is the king reacting to this interpretation. It's the king looking at God, the God of Israel, and saying, no, I am Babylon. Babylon will not fall. Let us make an image of all gold representing my kingdom, my dominance. Let's represent Babylon at its finest. So we see already a heart of rebellion right here where the king is making a statement. I don't know who this God of Israel is, but he ain't king. Not here. Let's continue reading. The king, then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that, the, that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar wait, yep, had set up. I thought I lost my place there. I'm, I apologize. <laughs> and the herald proclaimed aloud, you are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that the king Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshiped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So a lot of stuff just happened, and a lot of it is repetition, right? So uh, again, let's just get, let's play this movie in our mind. Let's be there, okay? Verses two or three, you see eight classes of officials that are brought, right? So in our terms, if we were going to kind of translate what those officials were doing, the best uh, some scouts have come up with is uh, the protector of the realms or the chief representatives, the commanders, the civil administrators, the counselors, the administrators of the funds, the administrators of the laws, the enforcers of the laws, uh, and others who served in a similar capacity. So all these very, very important people, okay, are commanded to worship this image. Now, this is a very impressive sight because this is anybody that's anybody. The who's who of Babylon is coming together and they are commanded to worship. And the herald proclaimed that they needed to worship and bow down when you heard the lyre, the psaltery, the symphony, this, this great orchestra, which brings us to another uh, debate that I just want to as an aside mention, there's some scholars that believe that Daniel was written, well, well, traditionally we see Daniel being written sometime around the sixth century, uh, but some scholars are trying to, trying to argue that it was written later because of some of the language that's there and, and, and they're saying that this was a response to other stuff. And, uh, but the reality is that the word, some, like liar, psaltery, the, uh, oops, that's how we think this, yeah, psaltery, sorry. Um, those kinds of words are borrowed from Greek, and they say that the Greeks didn't really get to that region until like the third century. So they're saying that it got written louder, uh, later, I mean. However, what we end up seeing is that the Greeks were already trading in the sixth century. In fact, as early as the eighth century, they were trading there. So it wouldn't be uncommon for these people to already have these words to use. So that's not really uh, debunking any kind of date. It's just still up for debate. I just want to clarify that. But again, moving on to the, the, the main point of, of what I, I believe God wants us to, to see is that there is a golden image that's glistening in the sun. 
There's a grand orchestra playing music and a king demanding worship. And not only that, there's also consequences for non-compliance. So if you don't worship, it's over. No pressure, huh? So what we end up seeing is that this king, like many people in power, makes sure to manipulate the people, in fact, even including elements of religion, to get the people to worship a false god. To get to the people to worship an idol. Because let's be honest, people in power love to manipulate, and, or, or politicians sometimes love, not sometimes, but I'm gonna be generous, sometimes, love to manipulate and, and, and m try to mix together half-truths in order for us to, you know, vote for them and to give them authority over things. And, and we see this uh, today. We see how people try to use Scripture to make us buy into their campaign. And all of a sudden, they don't go to church the four years that they're in office or the six years if they're senators. But election time comes, they're at every church. They know all the hymns, doing all the songs. They know every Bible verse. They all, they all quote the same one though, so it's kind of funny. But what we see is that although this is antiquity, the strategy has not changed. The manipulation has not changed. He even put music in the background. And when you hear the music, right, to evoke emotion, bow to this image. However, there are always people that do not fall for these tricks and stay faithful to the true king. And we, fe we see them in verse 8. We're going to be reading verse 8 through 12. Scripture says, therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused uh, the Jews. They declared to the king, to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of instrument shall fall down, worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Here we are introduced to, not to the other, the, the Radshak and Benny. I've just found out about them two weeks ago. I'm not, I, I thought I was well-versed in veggie tales. I guess not. But we are introduced to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We're actually, we introduced to them in chapter one. But we get to see them here again. In chapter one, uh, they were part, along with Daniel, they were with the king, and they were being taught the ways of working in the courts. And part of what they had to do was they had to eat at the king's table. But what the king offered was unclean. And they said, no, we're not going to eat that. And the, the guy that was in charge was like, dude, if you don't eat that, you're going to not be healthy. And if you're not healthy, I'm going to get in trouble. And you're not going to be here anymore. And Daniel and these three men actually stood up and said, look, we're going to trust our Lord. Let us eat what we eat. You eat what you eat. And, and we'll see how it goes. Well, how it went was they were healthier and they were more efficient than the people that were eating at the king's table. So we see that these men are no strangers to God's providence. These men are no strangers to God providing and to God protecting, and that they know that God always is in control even when things seem to fall apart. Now, it is easy or it is logical to assume that these Chaldeans that snitched on them, let's be honest, because that's what happened, that told, just in case you don't know what snitch, they, they told the king about what was happening. It is logical to think that they did this in bad faith. It is logical to think that maybe they were jealous of these three men. Why do they have special treatment? They eat different food. They don't have to follow the rules we have to follow. Uh-uh, this, this is going to end today. So they go over to the king and they say, yo, king, you know those three dudes, the guys that we got from Israel, 
right? You know, you said everybody has to worship or else they, they you know, it's done. Well, they're not doing it. I, look, you didn't hear it from me. <laughs> you didn't hear it from me, but they're not, they're not worshiping. They're not, they're not doing what they're supposed to do. And it is to be expected that people following the rules of the king would feel some type of way that people were not. At the end of the day, Babylon is known to be a place of order. You have to follow the laws of the king. What kind of example would it set that some of these officials that are Jewish would not follow? Why are they exempt? There is no exemptions in Babylon. We all fall in line. And if you don't fall in line, you're gone. So it is, again, easy to see that they were probably jealous, or at least they did not like the fact that there were exceptions to this. Now, what I want us to notice is that apparently their failure to worship the image was not discovered until the Chaldeans made it known. This shows me that their actions weren't really public, but they weren't hiding it either. So they weren't going around and going, we will not bow, we will not bow. They weren't writing Facebook posts about, well, this is just going horrible. This nation is losing its way, but they did stand for what was right. They didn't have to publicly say, I'm not doing it. They just didn't do it. And when they didn't do it, it caught people's attention. You see, when we live lives according to the scriptures, people will notice. People will know we're people of the kingdom. And sometimes we, we are so quick to want to defend Christ. Christ does not need a bodyguard. He doesn't. Look, I, I fall short on this all the time. I like to argue. I do. I, I, had, to, I had to leave Facebook because I couldn't do it. Like, real talk. And my father completely challenged me on this. God doesn't need you to protect him. He's God. He can handle himself. But again, even though we might not need to be vocal about it, people notice. They didn't complain about the pagan uh, traditions that were happening in Babylon. They didn't say, oh my goodness, what's going to happen now? Oh my goodness, I'm going to burn in a fiery furnace. They just didn't bow. Because the actions, these actions that were, were what brought attention to them. You see, when you act in allegiance to the kingdom of heaven, your actions will always draw attention. People will always know. But let's continue reading. Verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, these men, oh, sorry, these men, oh, I lost my track, uh, commanded, so they brought these men before the king. There we go. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, and bagpipe, and every kind of music to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But you, if, you don't, if you do not, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? In verse 13, we notice that our allegiance to the kingdom of God will sometimes cause anger and confusion because our allegiance to the kingdom of God undermines the powers that are around us. See, sometimes God is going to call us to do things in a way that will not align with what the United States or whatever country we may live in uh, believes we should do. And that's okay. And th but that is always going to cause friction. Some people are not going to understand some people are going to be angry. Hen, hey, and that's okay. It is to be expected that when we follow King Jesus, some people just won't understand. But in verses 14 and 15, we see that Nebuchadnezzar still gave them a chance to show that they were actually loyal to him. 
he tells them, oh, look, let's do this again. Let's play the music, bring it back the music, and, and then when you hear the music, just bow, and it'll be like nothing happened. And we also see Nebuchadnezzar assert his claim to be the absolute authority, because at the end he says, let's be honest, because if you don't bow, what well, God is really going to save you? Who's really going to save you from the fiery furnace? This is where it gets awesome. It's been awesome, but this is like it right here. <laughs> Verse 16 through 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the, from the burning, fiery furnace. Nice. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even, but if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. I want to stay here for just a couple minutes. Here we see two kinds of people so far. We see Nebuchadnezzar, a man who lives life through a nationalistic, egocentric lens. He believes to be the ultimate authority. He believes that his nation is the ultimate authority, and he is going to challenge anything and anybody that stands in the way of the greatness of Babylon. He shows his power in extravagant, loud, and in-your-face ways. He decides to force people to praise when he ha what he has done. He threatens those who do not praise his accomplishments and uses every tactic of manipulation he can to achieve his goal. Then you have these three men, men who live through the lens of the kingdom of God. They humbly reject the nation's sinful ways. They are thrust into the spotlight without seeking it, and then, and only then, they are vocal about where they stand. And they trust fully in the sovereignty of God. This is incredibly powerful and incredibly informative for us in our lives because these men's response is powerful. If you, when you read verse, verses 17 through 18, you will see that they say, look, king, you can throw us in there, but our God is strong enough that he can deliver us. Not only can he, he will deliver us. In fact, some of the translations, uh, it shows that they were certain. They, they didn't say God can deliver us. They said God will deliver us. And then they hit you with this, but even if he doesn't. Some of you caught that. But even if he doesn't, it's okay. We still won't bow. And my concern, brothers and sisters, as pastor, my concern as Christian, as someone that wants to see all of you just rejoice in the kingdom of God, is that we are all very proud to say that God will deliver us, but some of us can't get to the even if he doesn't. Some of us will say he delivers us, but are very, very nervous of that even if he doesn't. And you might say, Pastor Marcos, why would you say this? I am a proud American. I am a proud uh, Christian. I will do anything. Well, well, okay, well, let's reflect on the last five years. Here we go, people. Strap in. 2016. The president, uh, uh, former President Donald Trump win wins. Half the Christians are so excited and the other half are devastated. And some of us, instead of encouraging those that were devastating and say, hey, look, God is still in control. We were just so excited that we owned Hillary Clinton that we were too busy celebrating and not encouraging our brothers and sisters. Then it flips. 2020, President Biden wins. Now the story is flipped. The one half that was very excited is distraught. It's the fall of our nation. And the other half is excited because finally democracy is safe. And again, no encouragement from some. No acknowledgement that at the end of the day, Christ is still king. Right. 
And what's even worse to me is that some of us were quick when our candidate lost to say, oh, well, God is king, but we didn't say that when our candidate won. We almost said as if to reassure ourselves, well, our candidate didn't win, but at least we have Jesus. Like as if he's some kind of backup and not the true king. I told you I'm direct, y'all, I'm sorry. But the reality is that we need to address this. We need to address our hearts. We need to address our minds here. And this occurring to many of us, this is a very, very, very easy thing to fall into. And many of us, because we have engaged in this kind of behavior, it is out of a reaction of the lens that we view what's happening in the United States. You see, unfortunately, our reactions, sometimes it's more akin to Nebuchadnezzar angrily trying to force people to do what he thinks is right instead of being like these three men who were faithful to the end. We believe that the potential fall of our nation, as we see it, somehow is the end of the freedom and identity that makes us free. That makes us who we are. And then because we believe that this is an affront to who we are, we get on a hopeless frenzy. Now, before you start writing to uh, Pastor Drew saying that Pastor Marcos doesn't love America, all right, let me just back up real quick. I want to just clarify something, okay? I love this country. I, could, I, I love Puerto Rico. I want to live in Puerto Rico eventually, but I know I'm, my family's better off here. That's just the reality, and I love it. I'm not proud of everything that America does. I don't think any of us are, but I love this country. I'm not saying you shouldn't celebrate today, go out on a barbecue. I was celebrating yesterday, and I'm going back to celebrate today. I'm not saying you can't have your political opinions or preferences, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't speak up against injustice or on behalf of those uh, of the least of these. That's actually a biblical mandate. We should do that. I'm not saying we shouldn't hold accountable those who try to circumvent the the promises of freedom in the Constitution through votes or whatever. But what I am saying is that the people of God, that we, the people of God, have never needed those promises to truly be free and have an identity. You see, our freedom and identity does not come from any legislation, but it comes from the fact that the Son of God came to earth, taught us what it's like to live in allegiance to the kingdom. He paid our debt by dying at the cross so that we could enter the kingdom, and then empowered us through the Holy Spirit to live as free citizens of the kingdom of God. This is what it means to live free. And the reality, people, is that I see so much hopelessness amongst us. Hopelessness driven by the fact that some of us have fallen into the trap of looking through the lens of nationalism and not through the lens of the kingdom. I'm not saying you can't be disappointed. But what I'm saying is that we still have hope, y'all. The reality is that God is sovereign. And when we trust in the kingdom of God, no matter what happens around around us, we will be free. So we have two choices here to conclude. We can Look at it as the fall of America if you want to, or you can look at it as a chance of revival. You see, the beauty of the kingdom of God is that we never depended on our circumstances, we never depended on the laws of a nation, we never depended on who was in power. We depended on the Holy Spirit empowering us to do God's work. And God is always faithful. You see, what happens to these three men is that they go into that fiery furnace. In fact, he made it seven times hotter to make sure they were gone. And the Bible says that while they're in there, somebody asked, yo, wasn't it like three dudes that we entered there? He's like, yeah, why? He's like, because I see a fourth one, and that one looks kind of like a god. So I don't know what's happening, people. 
What man tried to use to crush his people, God used to lift up his name. And you might say, but pastor, you said even if he doesn't, he did it. He saved them. Okay, let's look at the disciples now. Did you know that all of the disciples were martyred except one? That's our heritage too. They lived out even if he doesn't. You know what happened? In their deaths, if you read the book of Acts, it'll say there's a pattern that emerges. There is a pattern of they preach or they do something that's of the kingdom of God. They get challenged. They push back by saying, no, we will follow Jesus. Then they try to get killed. But afterwards, instead, it usually ends with, and the word of God spread, and many believed. Brothers and sisters, as Christians, we live for the expansion of the kingdom of God, even at the cost of our own personal comfort. Because when we see through the lens of the, uh, of the kingdom of God, we don't see, we don't get, or we don't get uh, uh, discouraged by what's happening. We see that there's an opportunity for us to truly show how great our God is. And that should excite any citizen of the kingdom because that's what we were called to do in the first place. So all this to say, I just want to encourage you. Look, I don't know what's going to happen with our country. I have my opinions, but that doesn't matter. What matters is that no matter what happens, no matter what party is in power, no matter if our, the laws we believe should happen, don't happen, and all that stuff, that is not going to take away anything from us. We will still be free. We will still rejoice. Because at the end of the day, we know that God will still be glorified. That's what matters at the end of the day. Let's do this together, people. Let's encourage one another. Let's put away the lens that has given us hopelessness. And let's see the world through the lens of the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you because you know, we know that you are with us. We know that you care for us. We thank you, Father, because we know that you are always in control. Lord, sometimes when we see what's happening in our world, it can be so, so easy to just be hopeless, to get angry. But right now, like Job, we will say, even if you slay me, I will be faithful. Allow your Holy Spirit to be in our hearts and our minds to transform so that we would be able to live out this hope and that your name and your kingdom will be known through all the ends of the earth, and that we would be, and we would play a part in that mission. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you receive that, would you say amen? Amen. 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 Let's stand together. Let's respond as we sing hymn number 560. Hymn number 560, Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus just to
let's just sing that chorus again. We'll sing it together a cappella, very prayerfully, as we go out of this song. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. You may be seated. to trust him more. Let that be a prayer for all of us today. The beautiful thing about today is not only do we get to listen to the word of God, but we also get to celebrate four young members of this family who are publicly showing their allegiance to the kingdom of God. And that is always a very exciting time to see us. It's so awesome. Uh, just a reminder, because some of you might be, I, I think most of you are from you know, here, so you guys know that what we're going to be celebrating today is baptism. Baptism is a, a, an acknowledgement of a commitment that we have made to King Jesus, that we will serve him, that we will be with him and walk alongside him. It's a reminder that Jesus lived the perfect life and paid for our sins so that we would be accepted and we would be, enter, be able to enter the kingdom of God. Pastor Drew mentioned while he was talking to, to, uh, to those who would be baptized, it's like a wedding ring. The wedding ring doesn't make you married, but it shows that you are. And in that same way, baptism that doesn't it's not that saves you, but it shows to the world that you are his. And we are going to celebrate that today. So I'm, I'm very excited. We have four young individuals to uh, baptize today. So uh, once we are set, awesome, yeah, we are ready to start. We will start first and foremost with Elijah Kirk. My, uh, his mom, Shelly, will be speaking a few words. Oh. Elijah has chosen as his verse, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Elijah Kurtz, is it your testimony that you have received Jesus Christ by faith as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes. And is it also your testimony that you desire to love him, serve him, obey him, and follow him all the days of your life? Yes. Then in obedience to command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, so right now we have three siblings, Ava Kruger, Emma Kruger, and Andrew Kruger. Uh, they will have some words uh, that were written by their parents that will be shared uh, by Heidi Foreman. So I see Ava in the window, but Andrew and Emma, I hope you can hear me. These are words from your parents, and they want you to know that they are so excited that you've all chosen to accept Jesus and now be baptized. 
They promise to always pray for and encourage you as you continue on your faith journey. And they'd like to share a verse with you. This is the verse. It's from 1 Timothy 4.12. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. We will begin with Ava, who has chosen also John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Ava Kruger, the leader testimony that you have received Jesus Christ by faith as your personal Lord and Savior. And is it also your testimony that you desire to love him, serve him, obey him, and follow him all the days of your life? Then in obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We will be following up with Emma Kruger, who has chosen Psalm 23, 6. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Emma Kruger, is it your testimony that you have received Jesus Christ by faith as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes. And is it also your testimony that you desire to love him, serve him, obey him, and follow him all the days of your life? And in obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Last but not least, we have Andrew Kruger, who has also chosen John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Holy Spirit. Amen. That was awesome, y'all. That was great. Let's pray. Let's thank the Lord. Father, we come into your presence at this time just thanking you because we know that this commitment is a serious commitment, but a commitment that just changes our lives for all the better to be able to know that we can go to you, our creator, and that you can guide us in your path, that we can, you can guide us to be the people that you created us to be. There's nothing greater, no, nothing more uh, that could bring us more joy than this truth. I'm so happy that we would be able to celebrate this, and uh, especially in, in a day where we celebrate the independence of our country, Father, knowing and understanding that you are the purveyor of all freedom, of all liberty, from all sin, and we understand that you are the one that can guide us through it. We thank you for the celebration. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, church, let's stand and let's sing in light of what we both heard today and saw today. Let's sing that Christ would be magnified in our lives. Oh, Christ be magnified and let his praise arise. 
center of my life, Christ be magnified. My father was a pastor of a multicultural uh, bilingual church. We had people from Honduras, Costa Rica, Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic. We had Americans that spoke English, every shade, culture, culture imaginable. At any given Sunday, you would see that collection of people. And something that he would teach us is you can be proud. He would say, I am a proud Puerto Rican man, but before that, I'm a proud citizen of the kingdom. That informs the way we look at things, that informs the way we approach our culture, approach our ministry, or approach our community, and I hope that that could be our heart today, if it hasn't been already. Let us be, first and foremost, citizens of the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. Love you guys. Join you in your sufferings, then I'll join. 